<coughs> Welcome everyone. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to wait a few more minutes as always. Hope you're all doing fine today uh, with all of the lunar collapse news. Um, hope nobody got caught in the crossfire. But uh, we're going to wait a few more minutes for people to join. Gonna wait uh, 30 more seconds and then we're going to start. Hello, you you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, should I start? Uh, I'm. We're going to start in like 20 seconds, so... <laughs> All right, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, 10th weekly dev call. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, these past few calls have been really good. Uh, so uh, I think we're all familiar with what we do here. We update each other on the progress of our grantees of the project, discuss issues, uh, ideate around different approaches and so on and so forth. Um, today we have uh, four things on the agenda. We have uh, an update on the continuous chess by Martin. We have uh, an update on uh, the state as an argument by Verde, and uh, he's also got, I think, a front end working for the original Cairo chess. Uh, then we uh, have uh, some updates on the MEV tools by DSI, and then uh, Fran is going to present his uh, new project, uh, his machine learning project Giza on Starknet. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, I think, uh, Verde, if you want to start, uh, we can go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, can you hear me fine? Let me. Yeah, we can hear you me... perfectly. All right. Uh, okay. So, first thing, uh, let, wait, let me. Uh, yeah, share the entire screen. One second. Okay, you you can see my screen, right? Uh, yes. It's, currently, it's black. Yeah, yeah, it's black. <laughs> I guess I have to move stuff to the okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, let me something like this. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure why, but it, it doesn't matter. I will. Uh, let me. Let me. <laughs> can Can you tell me if you see the presentation? Uh, no, it's still black. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, damn. Um, Okay, maybe uh, Martin, uh, can can you start doing the presentation and I will test this uh, somewhere else and come back. Uh, sure. Um, okay. Maybe it has to do with like the different windows. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No problem. Uh, then uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead with Martin. Martin, are you here? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. I was sort of sleeping so <laughs> i was finishing putting some coffee into my body but okay let's go <laughs> so
so as usual i have some trouble finding the things here okay okay so uh, <laughs> Can you see I'm uh, sharing the screen? Yes, it works. Okay. So, okay. Um, well, I'll try to, yeah, talk a little bit uh, about where we are right now with the, with, we started the coding part, like we are into the, the Cairo contracts right now, the basic logic of the whole thing. And uh, okay, for the first slide, I just wanted to share a little bit of text of what was in the objectives of the project. So let's say a big part of the project was to try to generalize chess in the sense that um, generalize the pieces logic, the topology of the board, whatever. This, this is actually copied for, from the actual project. Mm -hmm. But okay, once you start to deep, to go deeper into this, then okay, things change a little bit. So I would like to show a little bit where, where are we now, uh, as I am, um, yeah, la last time I was sort of uh, sharing a, bit, a little bit where we were. Uh, I talked about um, yeah, and some layers of logic, let's say, about how the core contracts in Cairo are. Yeah, in a way, there are like two separated basic layers of contracts. One layer has to do with the game logic, uh, which is uh, the generalization of the pieces logic, how they move, what patterns they use, generalization of the topology of the board. This is pretty much how it was stated in the initial draft of the project, but also, uh, yeah, changes of state should be added here, at, the, at least the deterministic part of the changes of state. And we added some particular feature that is uh, this color interaction that I, I I will not talk too much right now about it, but maybe in a later presentation. And then on top of this, even if you see it, see it here, like yeah, game logic on top. But the idea is you have the, the this core of game logic, and then on top of it is the play system logic where you manage the game. You can uh, have arbitrary number of players, arbitrary number of turns in the, in the sense that you can repeat turn. The, the, the system of the, the game, maybe you can repeat turns or whatever under some circumstances. You, have, you can have elements of randomness in a system of rewards. So this, this will not be in the first iteration. This, this is the second iteration. First iteration will be about the game logic. But okay, this is like the general design, and then in a there is a third layer which is related with tokenization, and this tokenization, tokenization, yeah, may uh, allow players to, yeah, this idea of play and earn, and also the idea of non-stable games that we sort of trying to use is related with changing the rules. You can sort of change the rules during the game, along the game, in some sense. So I, this is like a brief intro, and I will try to go a little bit faster. This is like the, this is actually the main thing I wanted to share today. Why are we designing, sort of the design, the general design of how we are yeah, approaching this idea of uh, continuous chess and the generalization of the game. We are trying to do here three main things. Minimize computation. This is a very important thing. And in a later slide, we will see a particular thing that I wanted to share. 
So our idea is all the computation that can be done in the front end should be done in the front end, in a way. So we will see an example later on, but this is a, an important idea of the design. Uh, granularity, yeah, we'll, um, we want to sort of allow to the, the design. In general terms, you should be able to register, to, to use the blockchain, to use Cairo, uh, only to put in storage what you want. Not to have a big amount of computation and uh, to, to be set in stone what you can sort of what you can use the contracts for. So this leads us to game design modularity. The, the idea is that you can use the, the contracts like, yeah, like uh, building your own game, your board pieces, rules, the, the structure of the game, but also how you want to use the blockchain to, yeah, to store information. Maybe you don't want to store uh, or that information maybe you just want to have some nft stored and some other stuff but not every move every little bit of logic of the game or maybe you want whatever but this idea of modularity goes along this that line let's say so um, this is a little bit more in detail how it should work it is not like these contracts in the pay system it is, this is more like the logic of the thing, but all the, these are the contracts in Cairo, Cairo slash Starnet. So basically you check the validity of a move, given a set of game rules and given a state of the board, you check if some move is valid, you can compute the change of state and all these is managed from the logic of the play system. You can manage turns, rewards, change of state, and a lot of other stuff. This is right now, I don't, I am not separating this in the play system. It's just like one bit here, but later on, I, I, we are designing this part. It is not like we are coding this part right now. So I wanted to go a little bit more into detail what this all means, hopefully. Please, Swaktimus, let me know if I am using too much time. I will try to be brief here. Um, this is like a little bit more in detail what I'm talking about. Uh, the, about the game logic, let's say. The check validity this is like the main function in the game logic. So here you have some ballots that may help understand what we're doing, what, what's the approach. Um, all the game rules are stored in the contracts and are referenced with an ID. The idea is when you do a, when you do a transaction through the contracts, you only give the ID. It is minimal what you give. You give the ID and this way you are setting what game you are talking about. Then you, um, yeah, every set of game rules consists of a set of patterns. It is very straightforward and simple. It will be published in the contract, what, uh, what this set of rules are. And every piece is sort of, yeah, uh, you have a number of patterns that describe how, how the piece interacts and move, moves on the board and interacts. So the front end, and this is a, a point that I wanted to show, really maybe the whole presentation is about this part that I wanted to show. Maybe if anyone uh, wants to give any feedback or comments later on or whatever, the idea is the front end sends or the server, we are working on the architecture, but okay, the front end sends the idea of the game rules. So what, what's the set of rules for this game? and sets, uh, sends the board state, the state of the board, and the move. And also, it, the, the front end already computed what's the pattern that allows this piece to go in this direction to this action. So uh, the idea is the front end also sends to the contract the idea of the pattern. So the, the contracts don't have to compute 
every possible move for this piece, but uh, the the contract all only will compute what is needed to prove that this piece, given this set of rules, given this board state, given all these parameters, this piece can the, the, the contracts will prove that this piece can make this move, this action in general. So it is, uh, and this is like a general idea for the whole construction. The, the front end gives as much information as possible and uh, the, vali the validity of the whole thing as a construction, as a computation, it depends on the, uh, on the logic being clear how the games works and so on. Okay, okay, this this may require some discussion, but this is the main idea. As much informa information should be sent from the front end to the contracts. Then how it works, the, the algorithm, this is actually more or less done by, by now. The, the contracts receive, um, okay, let, let, let's, see how it is phrased here. Comparing a sequence of squares, which is the move, the actual move from this square to this square with a given pattern of the acting piece. The, the patterns are here, are the patterns of a, the piece that describe the, the possibilities of the piece. And the engine that compares, this is similar to a regular expression engine. I, I didn't check the formal definition of a regular expression. Uh, expression engine so i don't want to say it's the same but it looks pretty much the same so there is an engine let's say in cairo in these contracts that check the sequence of squares against the pattern so the pattern may look something like there's a white piece a number of three squares in between here you have an asterisk this is a rebel expression how, how many free squares you want and a black piece this is like a capture the sequence you send, so the state, this is computed from the board actually, but this is like the white rook, free square, free square, black pound. Let's say this is the situation on the board. And this checks like a valid sequence for this pattern, as many free squares as you want. You have two in this case. And then to compute the state, the outcome, the, the change of state, you use a replacement pattern and yeah, the last um, the last slide, you may see this in a more concrete way. You are checking, comparing the sequence of uh, squares with a given pattern. The given pattern actually looks like this in, in Cairo. It's a, a W is like the set of all white pieces. And okay, you have some syntactic, uh, elements here but the important thing is you have the f like, like, like the f is the set of the um, free squares and then you have an asterisk that means how many free squares you want you can have and then a b, a b for the black pieces and a t for termination and uh, the sequence of squares looks like this in Cairo. so this is what is rep representing and then you compute it is true you build this uh, uh, yeah, array with double entries uh, where you have the pattern and the actual square, what is in, in the actual square, and then you have a replacement pattern that tells you what to put in every place. So the, the rook finally took the pawn and it is sort of validated like this. So, okay, last time. Uh, I was required to be a little bit more technical. Hopefully it was not too much and I, nobody is sleeping by now. But I guess I, I tried to make it as concrete as possible. And I think if anybody has a question later on can ask me, but I think uh, we should jump into the next presentation or in any way you want or Swaktimus if you want to say something. Yeah, so so thank you for that. Uh, I think it's, it's great that you've been a bit more technical this time, which is uh, awesome to get a good overview. Uh, if anybody has questions, then you're welcome to ask them now. Uh, I think it's better when it's fresh in memory. Uh, so any questions, remarks, uh, ideas for Martin, uh, please don't be shy.
of course if anybody wants to write something in the channel or dm me or whatever um all the thing will be open source as soon as possible as soon as we check it so you will you will be able to toy with the thing if you really are interested or whatever I had a quick question on the uh, front end. Um, have you kind of uh, looked into what that uh, UI built out is going to look like? Uh, the, 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 um, how the interface will be with the user or what framework we will use or? Uh, uh, framework. Uh, we are very much tempted by using Vue this this general framework uh, we we were first looking into react and so on and right now we are sort of setting into view and by now it's not like the now uh, we are mostly coding in cairo but the whole sort of little research we did we think we prefer right now to use view Or at least try. Uh, do you know if, like, um, um, Argent uh, get Starnet and Starnet JS will work with Vue.js? Have you researched mm, this? We, I can answer that one. Uh, on brick side, everything is in Vue, so it works. Thanks. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh i will take that into account for making my frontends now i can actually you, you can check out the brick repo to see exactly how we how we did that but we've we've bundled stuff in js inside of it and it works yeah this is great information i definitely will um, i have a question for you martin um if i understand correctly you're storing the game the I will say the game rules on chain, meaning that, okay, that piece can do this thing, this thing, this thing. Um, how, how do you foresee managing that list? Let's say I want to add something to that list. I want to add a new piece, a new rule set. Um, how would that work out? Yeah, this is a very good question. <laughs> this is a very good question. Uh, let's say that while we are doing this, sort of this prototype thing, so let's say you want to jump with such a library or something into protection you just set up the rules you want and you just use the underlying library and everything if it's well built should work okay if it, then um, while doing our project we will be sort of updating this list these possibilities of the contract as, as long as Really will be some iterations going on by force, so we don't find any problem on doing like this. And from a very general point of view, you should be, yeah, we could build an interface so you, um, yeah, in a very tight manner, you explicitly send the rules you want to be in place for a given game. This, this vector, this information could be very very big if the game is complex but you can you could actually probably the, the, once we publish this as a library we will offer this interface that you can just send whatever vector of rules you want uh, it will be heavy but you will be able to yeah see it and, and, and sort of set it uh, whatever any way you want. I'm not sure if this answers the question. Okay. Uh, if there's no other questions uh, or remarks, then uh, I would like to move on to Fran and Giza actually because I know that yeah. Fran has a call at uh, 6 p.m. So for the sake of uh, this timeline today, <laughs> we're, we're going to move to Fran. I hope it's okay with everybody else. Uh, uh, Fran, if you're here, uh, we would be ready for your presentation. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Swap, for 
that's in me in the middle. So, can you hear me, right? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Yes? Okay. So, let me share my screen and I start. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. All right. So, <clears throat> glad to be here presenting Giza. Giza is like, uh, it's intended to be like a scaling solution for for current um, machine learning deployment solutions on cloud uh, with uh, that has um, some benefits uh, over current web two, and also it opens like a new landscape of new use cases to be built on on a Starnet and also to be uh, used on on Ethereum mainnet. And the the purpose, the main purpose is like bringing machine learning models that are built on chain they are trained on on any framework like uh, you have on python or or whatever uh, language and framework like tensorflow or pytorch to bring them to bring them uh, on chain um, and and you can use it like from smart contracts and also like uh, from from web two services as we will see later um also uh, one of the main points of, of GISA is like solving like uh, some of the issues that current web two solutions on cloud have like for the scaling and deploying machine learning models. And three of the main points are like weak interoperability, and this is because um, models on, on web two like they they can be made in many different frameworks, and there is no defined standard in order to to deploy the models or 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 the standard definition for for using them in production, right? Um, because of this, the, the process of, of deploying to production is like uh, very time consuming uh, and it takes like a lot of time, like we will see later. And also the architecture to deploy these models uh, is like very complex in order to have like a full full traceability of what, what is happening and how the model is behaving, how the architecture scales and uh, logs and traces uh, in order to have all of that in a production system for machine learning uh, it takes a lot of architecture around uh, one of the main things is like too much time in production and this is like uh, the source is um, a paper from algorithmia about the state of ml on enterprise and you can see here like uh, most a lot of time that is uh, dedicated to to building a, a ML project is is dedicated to put it putting it in production like up to thirty percent of of time like thirty days or uh, or even ninety days. So it is like a lot of time and resources and and cost associated to to that. And um, the plan is like. Uh, with this solution to, to ease all this management and, and it's like the deployment. Also, uh, as I mentioned before, like the maintenance costs are massive in these systems that are like served in production because you have like to maintain a lot of um, services around the, the model itself because you, you need to monitor the model, uh, take the traceability, ensure like the, the infrastructure is behaving correctly, that it can scale uh, as intended and all this kind of, of of processes. Here, this is like from a paper from, from Google, so you can check it out uh, on Google for more information. And this is like a typical uh, system for machine learning on, on typical AWS or, or Google Cloud Platform. So moving, moving on to, to web-free uh, machine learning, one of the um, main benefits is like solving this this kind of problems like uh, solving interoperability uh, making the the models fully in chain with several uh, benefits and use cases that we will see and also it saves a lot of cost and because the architecture gets simplified uh, uh, huge hugely and, and and we can use it like easily okay and also with all of that the, the overhead that we have on, on time and architecture is like is solved, right? So moving into operability, in order to solve this this issue on on Giza and and how to deploy models on Starnet, 
uh, we standardize like we use like the ONNX standard that for serializing the 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 models. So we can take like any model from any popular framework like TensorFlow or PyTorch, serialize it to to ONNX, and then uh, deploy the deploy it to to Cairo. Also, using this format, it enables also to to make different make uses of different like hardware for for running inferences. Like for now, on on L2 is like only CPU, but uh, as we will re research on L3 scaling and and fractal scaling, we we can uh, enable the use of more speci specialized hardware like GPUs or FP FPGAs in order to, to accelerate the inferences and the performance. Uh, with that, we have like uh, good benefits, like um, we have like an unified implementation for all the models that are, are living on chain, like using on an X. And we have like wide compatibility with off chain frameworks. So we have like everything that data scientists or ML profiles uh, will need to, to bring models to production without uh, the need to make like big architectures around it. And for that, um, we made like the ONNX runtime, that is like the runtime that runs uh, the ONNX models on inference. Uh, we ported like all the operations and the, and the functionality to Cairo. And just to give a brief summary of how it works, um, ONNX, what, when it takes the, like the native framework, it converts, its, converts the model to, to a directed graph. And this graph in each node has like an operation and this operation is applied like in a form of tensors. So what we have done is like first implement a tensor library, a common tensor library for, for Cairo. So you, we can make these operations possible in, in a Starnet. Uh, on top of that, uh, we port like all the implementation of the ONNX runtime for the operators that are like which operate operations we run on the tensors. And on top of that, we have like the transpiler that uh, takes the, the native ONNX model in, in the off-chain of off training model. We interpret it and generate a smart contract with the, with the graph execution and, and ONNX uh, operators in Cairo. Um, as we deploy these this, uh, this machine learning models on fully on chain, they are like uh, they have they will have like an address for each model. We have an address, and this has like uh, many benefits. Like we have no downtime uh, as long as the blockchain is up, so the model will be and we will be ready for inferences. So it's a hundred percent uptime. Uh, it's censorship censorship resistant. It can be auditable. It can be stopped. So we have like all the traces, all the logs, who is using it, all the transactions. Um, and the model is like a smart contract for for transparency purposes. That is something like uh, traditionally in Web2 uh, models doesn't have. So here we can, we can achieve it. Regarding uh, architecture, we simplify like the previous uh, infographic that uh, I saw before. So all the manage, management of infrastructure and, and monitoring it's like uh, native in the starnet so we don't have to to, to to keep like the traces and the logs because we have like transaction hashes and all the transactions that are made to the smart contract that is like the model itself so we have this built in so we can save a lot of uh, infrastructure cost on that and also we can wrap this, this functionality with whatever extra functionality we may need, like analysis or extraction or whatever. Uh, this is these are like the, the main benefits of running this infra infrastructure. The scaling is automatically uh, managed by Starnet. We don't have to manage the resources. There is no maintenance cost. We only have for, for the usage. And uh, the architecture is L2 native. And in the future, like supported by L3 as well. So all, all good. As uh, I said before, uh, one of the main focus of GISA as well is like uh, researching on L3 scaling. 
So in order to have like more uh, specialized performance and usage of hardware like uh, GPUs, and also it can enable like more uh, privacy and, and control over over what models are being executed and how they are being executed. Also, we with Martin that presented before uh, the two of us, we we built like this initial implementation of when an Cairo. And, uh, and we built like we take we took a secure line linear regression and ported it to an NX in order to to deploy it to Starnet. And the framework is public; you can already access it. So check the tensor library, check the operators, and and the transpiler itself. So so you can start digging in. And that's that's everything about ISA. Any questions? I have a question actually. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if, um, do you think like if there are a lot of activity on Starknet and for example, many applications use um, Giza, uh, could it slow down the sequencer at some point, like slow down the performance? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, this is not like, I mean, for short term usage, like on, on the alpha alpha uh, status of Starnet more aim like for mainnet release or or in the future but when the sequencer is decentralized probably so I don't know if it can affect the performance of the sequencer. Okay. Are there some limitations that you foresee or or constraints? About the models itself, uh, I think there is no limitation. We can uh, port all the operators that are implemented on, on NX uh, to Cairo as they are like mathematical operations. Um, and that's everything we need for, for building like the model for inference. Okay, thanks. So one question I would have is, uh, some people may be confused why uh, Matchbox is interested in this. So can you talk a bit about how this relates to uh, on-chain gaming? Yeah, um, some of the benefits of using like Giza or Matchbox is like for powering uh, on-chain games. So we can have like ML control behavior on on-chain games, like the ones that are like on Realms or or even topology to 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 be enhanced with with the models that are on chain from Giza. And I have a question about that. So could this be used for non-player character inside games? Yep. To make okay, that's really cool. Because this is not possible to do in um, like normal web two games. Because um, I mean. I don't know if that's possible or not, but uh, yeah, is this already done in Web 2 or not? Uh, I think in Web 2 is, is possible too, but and here it will be as well. So so you can you can reach your game with uh, AI agents. So you 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 don't have fully like uh, humans playing the game, but also you have like AI around to to enrich experience. Okay, that's really cool. Any other questions for uh, Fran and Giza? I guess one question I had is, uh, are are you going to need to build out like a kind of linear algebra library for this, or are they kind of more specialized math functions like you were talking about? Um. So on NX is not based on, it doesn't understand about algorithms. It understands about operators and each algorithm is a specific graph executing specific operators in order. So in order to implement like all the possible algorithms supported by on NX, we only have to implement like the operators and execute them in a specific order. So we only have to, to load the weights and and make the graph with operators. So it's not nothing like related to, to linear 
library linear regression and arrow uh, linear algebra library or something like that is more like uh, tensor operators okay awesome uh, thank you so much Fran for presenting it's a fascinating project uh, yeah, thank you there are no other questions, then uh, I will take it uh, to uh, Green and try again with uh, your screen sharing. Uh, Green, are you still here? Hello. Yes. Um, so I, I got it working now. Uh, so yeah. Uh, do you want me to start? Uh, yeah, please. All right. Uh, one second. Um, I think it was this one. Um, okay, cool. Let me go to the beginning. All right, everyone sees it, right? Yes. The presentation, I mean, the slides. Yeah, we can see it. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, just Cairo. Uh, yeah, you may wonder, like, what what does this even mean? Because uh, Martin is already working on chess. So is everyone working on chess now? Uh, so yeah, pretty much Chess Cairo was the first iteration of the um, chess in StarNet thing uh, that me and Martin uh, began uh, back in January. We spent around three months building it. Um, sorry. And yeah, so it had a bunch of uh, challenges. It was an interesting experience. Uh, there was a bug that really set it back. And yeah, I just made the front end so we can kind of see it. Actually, uh, because it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, StarNet is a bit slow. I will just make a move now <laughs> so that we can see the results. So this says that it's, this is a test game I made. Uh, actually, if you go from the beginning, uh, from here, the front end will tell you, sorry, let me let it load. All right, uh, yeah, whatever. The front end will tell you that you can create a game here, but it doesn't work because I I get uh, an error with StarNet.js, so I have to deploy the um, contract manually. Anyway, let me just make a move like that. Um, I sign it. This account uh, is uh, allowed to make this move. So anyway, and we will come back after it uh, gets executed. So what is this? So this is chess. Uh, this is regular full feature chess. The original idea was to make a chess footer key and prediction market in order to incentivize parties to make bets on what the best move for a certain position was. Uh, you know, it's like gambling, but the end result will be a very good chess game. So it was interesting. Um, the main challenges that came with this project was minimizing storage differences or state differences. Because uh, as you may know, they are kind of the at least I was assuming that they were the bottleneck of CK rollups. So it was in my interest to uh, try to get those down to a minimum. So these are all the functions, I think. Uh, these are all the functions that can be done in Chess Cairo. And when you construct the game, uh, every, every game of chess in Chess Cairo is a contract that you have to deploy. Um, and everything else is one state differences. Uh, difference. So, yeah, it's pretty efficient. Uh, you may think that uh, it was kind of trivial to make it one state difference, but not really, because um, the whole thing with chess is that uh, I have it written here. Let me. The whole thing with chess is that the array of movements actually uh, is part of the full state of chess. You need to remember the move history. Mm -hmm because of the, uh, oh, I don't have it written here anyway, because of, yeah, because of threefold repetition. Uh, because one of the parties must be allowed to force a draw if the same position was executed. Uh, okay, uh, sorry if this presentation is a bit chaotic. So the move succeeded, I come here, I can refresh and we can check that. Yeah, it works, uh, please let it load. All right. If you're wondering why I didn't make a double pawn move, it's that there's a bug that doesn't allow it to happen. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So let's 
make an illegal move to see if it reverts. Uh, okay, back to the presentation, sorry. So uh, the way it works with one single storage difference is that uh, we need to uh, keep track of all the moves in the game. And the way we do that is that we just write the move uh, because the way the moves are encoded is that such that the move uh, um, the first bits of the felt are the origin, the others are the destination, and there are two bits to describe. Uh, in the case of a cranium, uh, like you know, upon coming to the last uh, row, uh, which piece do you want? So that's all the data that a move contains, and uh, it's very helpful because the move that uh, relates to the int zero, to the felt zero, is illegal. So um, mm -hmm. um, you can just write like append to the uh, quote array end quote of moves uh, mm -hmm. the last move. So you can like dynamically find out what the count of moves is, and then you just write it to the end. Um, all right. So the way it works is that you figure out uh, dynamically what the current fan state is with this function. And yeah, there were better ways to do it, but this was the thing we figured out at the time. Anyway, so was it worth it uh, currently? As the game becomes longer and longer and longer, uh, this dynamic generation of the actual state will take 500 steps per move. Uh, so it's not very efficient. Um, but still, it's one storage difference per interaction. So uh, most chess games are not that long, actually. They will usually be like 40 moves, so 80 plies. Uh, so this number is not going to be that large anyway, but still, um, it's not great. Oh, it says here, why have to store the moves? Oh, I already explained because of the threefold repetition thing. All right, so let's see the front end. I, I already showed the front end. Sorry if the presentation is a bit chaotic. Um, all right, so let me just explain how this relates with the status argument standard. If you don't know what the status argument is, please go to Discord, uh, a state management channel and scroll up um there will be an ocean file explaining what it is about but uh, you know in a few words instead of storing uh, all the full state in the contract you just pass the state as an argument and you only keep a hash of the state in the contract that way you are ensured to be able to advance the game with only uh, one state difference which will be updating the hash um yeah so i explain a bit this uh, the test name. Um, sorry, let me quit Slack because I'm getting bombarded with stuff. Right, sorry. So, um, yeah, actually, this statement here is not true uh, because I could have just stored the fan state. Uh, if someone is interested, I will show very quick. But uh, the way the fan is encoded. Oh, sorry, if you don't know what FEN is, F-E-N, it's um, this standard. Uh, let me FEN chess. It's like a uh, notation style. And we encode this notation style in a single felt. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Um, anyway. Uh, so you could, instead of storing the data of the moves, you could have a store defense. Um, yeah, we didn't realize that until late. It also removes the need. Yeah, so, okay, sorry, I got a bit lost. So the main interest for making a generalized state management solution is that uh, managing a state, and especially if you want it to be efficient, is very time consuming for, and requires a lot of development time and planning. Uh, it just so happened that in chess, uh, I was able to just uh, compress like all the information in a single state per action, but that's usually not the case. Like you can easily mm, think of an example, like maybe a role-playing game, like an RPG or something in which you level up in the same action in which you get an item 
for example, right? So that will at least require two state differences. So it's not this easy, that easy. Anyway, so maybe this standard will be uh, interesting, but it has a very big challenge. There is no on-chain state availability because you're only storing the hash. So how do we deal with this? Mm, it doesn't exist yet, but maybe we could have something like the graph for StarNet uh, because StarNet has events, as far as I know, and you could maybe react to them but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this will be feasible. Um, this is uh, very easily the biggest challenge with this uh, standard. Um, and I think this is what will eventually decide if this standard crashes and burns uh, catastrophically or, or maybe it becomes useful. Uh, but there's also the other challenge that it, uh, even if I figure out a way to make it abstract enough, it's still going to be annoying for the developer to figure out, um, you know, how do I order the data for my state encoding? And the thing is, there are actually two variants to this encoding. If you go through the notion, you will see there is a full variant and a Merkle variant, and they are different. Um, chess is small enough, so you can just store the full encode the state of chess in a single array, right? But with explosive, uh, explosively big games, you can think something like Minecraft, you can't really afford to store the state of, you know, like every cube in, in an array, like, obviously. So you need something like a Merkle tree. Anyway, we keep going, because uh, I want to finish this fast. So it should be simple to make an abstract solution. Yeah, so this is kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, but truth is, I lost so much time with this that I'm just going to finish the proof of concept of the uh, status argument for chess. So I will just make a custom solution. Uh, in the case of chess, if you were interested, uh, the way I will make it is that I will just store an array of encoded fans. First fan, the initial state, every other fan, state after the move. Um, uh, this way, I no longer have that linearly increasing cost while dynamically finding out the current state. Uh, I might add an array of moves, but probably not, because uh, with two contiguous fans, FENs, you can figure out what the move is, so it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, you need to store this, because the way the contract works is that uh, um, if you are making a draw, it's like a flag, right? So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, uh, I, I tried to really sprint through this because I don't, didn't want to take much uh, time for the call. If you are interested in this, please hit me up on uh, either this channel or this channel, I don't really care. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. If you got any question. Oh, could, could you hear me? <laughs> have you, have you yeah, been yeah, speaking? Yeah, we could hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any, any questions for, uh, for Green? I mean, it's definitely a more kind of dense uh, very technical, complex topic, so I don't blame anyone for not uh, coming up with questions right now. But uh, I'd still be happy to uh, hear any kind of questions. So um, if you have any, then don't be sure. Yeah, you, you can make questions either for the chess front end or, you know, questions like this live yet, <laughs> uh, or maybe about the status argument of mine. I know no one asked, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So um, I will deploy this front end when the current bug is solved. Uh, right now you can't make a double pawn move. Um, that's not very chess-like. So as soon as you fix that, I will deploy the front end so we can have like a small tournament of chess in StarNet, I guess. Cool, awesome. Thank you for, uh, for that. Um, if there are still no, no questions, then... Uh... I would like to move on to uh, DSI and his uh, updates on the MEV tools. D 
Yes. Design, are you ready? Yeah. So, hello everyone. Um, so I will just make a quick update about what I've been releasing for the past few days. Um, so the main thing, like how, uh, there are two things I want to talk about, which is um, so first, so my main uh, npm package, which analyzes transaction calls and events on Starknet, uh, I added uh, this analyzer folder, which analyzes uh, events. So for now, it's only swaps and transfers. Um, so yeah, this is just so to show you um, how it works. So yeah, basically. It's just that um, for a specific address, you can see how how much he swapped and what what token did he swap, um, and also the transfers uh, within a block. So all of this is within a, within a block, um, and so here you you have this address that yeah swapped those token, and for example this address that sent those token or received those token. You can see. If I receive many token or anything. Um, so this will be used for uh, to analyze uh, arbitrage and uh, MEV strategies on chain. So this is the first thing uh, that I worked on, and I think uh, something that is more interesting. Um, this is the um, uh, so I, I created a new class which analyzes accounts on Starknet and what it does it um, this code uh, take a block and take all transactions and uh, uh, yeah take all transactions and uh, fetch them into into an account and it sorts the most active accounts within a block so that you can see who is the most active and uh, analyze their transactions. And uh, then you can see um, so how many transactions they, they, do, they did. And also uh, what, transaction, uh, what function did they call and how many times. And you can basically uh, see the activity of an, of an account, see on what contract is uh, the most active. Um, so, he, for example, this contract, uh, yeah, contract account called the submit order function uh, 1,695 times on this contract, and so you can al analyze uh, from there um, his activity. And uh, yeah, you have this for. I think yeah, you you can change uh, how how much how many accounts you want to analyze. Um, so yeah, right now it's mainly um, like normal transaction that means swap and uh, manage contracts. But uh, I'm, ex I'm very excited to use this tool for on-chain gaming and see um, what people do. Um, did they make their own contracts? Are they calling their own functions? And what are they doing on chain? And uh, yeah, I hope we'll see more activity into gaming uh, in the coming weeks, so that uh, I can start using this tool and um, see what people are doing. Mm -hmm. So it's basically what I have been working on, um, mm -hmm. and I plan to improve this with uh, uh, once I can analyze more data and uh, like tweak uh, small details to make it more uh, interesting and more um, more precise in the way it analyzes uh, chain data. Um, but for now, that's how it looks like. And I will release this. So for the Startnet analyzer and the, the events, it's already published. And for the account analyzer uh, class, I will release it. Uh, pretty soon, I think. And yeah, that's it for what I've been working on. And uh, yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's going to be super interesting and useful to see what people are going to do in, in these on-chain games, right? Uh, so great stuff.
Uh, do we have any questions for Desai? Yeah, I have a question. Does it support like exporting the data to CSVs or something like that? Does it support? Exporting the data to CSVs or... Oh yeah, um, not yet. So right now, um, uh, I'm, I, I don't know very much about Web2 dev, so I'm learning right now to manage database and API uh, so that I make the data more uh, open. Uh, I need to learn about that and I'm noting the, the idea and uh, we'll try to make it as, as open as possible. Awesome. And what do you think uh, about making this tool available as a Nile plugin? Um, yeah, I mean, I really don't know how that would work. Right now, it's it just um, like TypeScript file that you can import into your uh, JavaScript code. Um, but if that's something that adds value to the project, um, I can definitely definitely dig into into the the way to make that work. Nice. Thank you. Any other questions? So in terms of uh, next steps, you said you're, you're waiting for uh, for more gaming for more gaming activity, uh, obviously. Uh, but like in terms of the tool itself, uh, is there anything any any kind of roadmap that you want to uh, address? Um, so right now I'm learning to manage database and API. So it should take I think two to three days to familiarize myself with all mm -hmm. the concepts, and then um, I. Uh, I will. Uh, I I need to dig into the the game we talk about and see if there are a few things uh, that can be done. Then I also I'm thinking about um, analyzing the brick contracts and see if there are any um, any people making uh, strategies about that. And if not, I'm thinking about a few like uh, one strategy that can be made like arbitrary strategy. Um, but right now it's mainly like keep improving the details uh, until until I can use the, the tools uh, in more broader way um, and exploring the StarkNet ecosystem. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, then... Uh... I, have a, I have a question. Sorry, I had yeah, to sure, switch. Okay. Devices. So I'm actually not super familiar with how StarkNet works. Like I am still trying to grasp my head around it. Um, when you so so, basically, my question is like: Is there really a concept of a public mempool in the same way that you have with normal things? Like, or are you just looking at transactions that have already been sort of like confirmed and already like uh, what's the term in the literature? I forget. You know, finalized where they're no longer going to be argued about. Does that make sense? Yeah. So right now, uh, there are no mempools, I think, in the sequencer. It's, it's, it's just like strictly sent to the sequencer and it's just uh, the first in uh, get the first place in the uh, final block. Um, so right now, I just analyze uh, like finalized transactions that are already included into the block. Um, and yeah, yeah it's, it's ba basically backward analyzing. Okay, so so basically where I'm going with this is like, I, I I don't think we're gonna see a similar like ecosystem of people trying to do like sandwich attacks because the sequencer is run by the Starknet people, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably it depends how how the transaction get ordered in the Starknet sequencer, um, but I think. Uh, sandwiching someone is very hard. Like phone training is is very very hard in a, a layer two first in first out uh, way of organizing transactions. But arbitrage and liquidation and MV strategies can be still very uh, wide. Okay. Thanks for uh, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. And uh, I can also chime in here. Uh, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure that Starkware is committed to not doing any kind of MEV as long as they operate the sequencer and then the goal is to decentralize the sequencers by the end of the year and once the sequencers are decentralized then uh, obviously people can uh, do whatever they want and, and it's also likely that there is going to be some kind of ordering system for transactions, some kind of uh, consensus system because if you decentralize sequencers then you have to have some kind of consensus uh, for the sequencers. Uh, so uh, I suspect there will be uh, much more MEV opportunities by the end of the year when uh, when they decentralize the sequences. And uh, yeah, um, I'm just going to wrap it up here. We're, we're like six minutes past the hour, so uh, I don't want to keep you guys here for another hour. So uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you to our grantees for presenting. Thank you for the great discussions. And uh, we're going to see you guys next week. See you guys. Thank you very much. Bye. See you. Thank you.